Mark Psalms, it's great to be speaking with you today. Good to be here. <laughs> Let me start off by saying it's been a real pleasure preparing for this episode. Your take on dreams, consciousness, the role of feelings, and your integration of psychoanalysis and neuroscience is quite unique and really refreshing. So to begin, can you give our audience a bit of a background on what drew you to the study of the mind and how you got started? Um, I, 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 I've worked this out in retrospect. Um, I think it started uh, in early childhood. Um, although it wasn't in early childhood that I sort of consciously made this decision, I, I think that a, a, a clear line can be traced from um, when I was four going on five, uh, my older brother named Lee, he fell off a three-story building uh, and fractured his skull and uh, sustained a, a, a hemorrhage in his brain. And, um, you know, thank heavens due to the wonders of modern medicine, neurosurgery in this case, um, he survived and, uh, and came back home. But he was never the same person. Uh, he was radically changed uh, uh, as, a, as a personality. And, um, you know, to a young kid, it's very, well, probably to anybody, but, you know, to, to, to me as a young kid, it was very disconcerting. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't fathom how this could be, you know, that this chap looked like Lee, but he wasn't Lee. And, you know, sort of where, where is my brother and, and, and who's this guy? Um, so that got me thinking, I think, earlier than for, I think most kids think about these sort of things one way or another at one time or another. Uh, but it got me thinking about them a little bit earlier and, and in a little bit more kind of concentrated a way um, the, uh, about how, how, what is the relationship between ourselves our sentient beings, you know, and and our bodies, and and in particular our brains. How how does it come about that I am a bodily organ, you know, and and what is the what is the nature of the relationship between these things? So although, as I say, I didn't decide there and then I'm going to become a neuroscientist. I think it's pretty clear that that's what set me on this path, and uh, so there you have it. Right, and. You started off your, you know, your journey of investigating the mind through neuroscience specifically, right? It was the physical aspect of how, how this brain organ, you know, how it brings about consciousness. From your experience starting out in that field, you know, I understand that when you started out, there was a little bit of frustration because you felt that certain things were missing in this field. What was that experience like? What did you feel that was missing in those early days? It is, um, it's correct what you say that I studied neuroscience and therefore I'm studying, you know, a, a physical organ. But, but this particular physical organ is special. Um, it, it, has, it has a property that no other physical thing ha that we are aware of uh, has, namely that it is, there is a subjective experience to being the brain. Um, you know, you can't speak about what is it like to be um, a, a light bulb. You know, what is it like <laughs> to be a table? <laughs> um, it's, it's a nonsensical question. But in the case of the brain, clearly there's an inner subjective, phenomenal, experiential aspect. So although it's true that neuroscience is a physical science, um, you know, surely this astonishing property of the brain um, is doing something. You know, surely, surely it's there for a reason. Um, and that was why I was disappointed. The branch of neuroscience that I was focused on is called neuropsychology, um, okay. also called behavioral neuroscience, you know, cognitive neuroscience. It goes by various names. But but the point is, I was particularly studying the relationship between mental functions and brain functions. And yet the way in which it was being taught, and I'm speaking here of the late, I mean, the early 1980s. I, okay. I came into the field in 1980. And um, 
at, at those days, you know, there was literally no reference whatsoever to subjectivity. Um, so I was learning about mental functions, but, um, it, uh, you know, I might as well have been learning about respiratory functions or digestive functions. You know, it was the, the functions of the brain uh, treated in exactly the same way as you would treat the functions of the heart uh, or the lungs. You know, it's just this, this thing out there. Um, right. The mechanism of which operates like this. So when we speak of mental functions, it would be the functions of memory, the functions of visual perception, the functions of language. But at no point uh, did anybody uh, e even raise the topic that to remember you know, is an experience. Uh, to right. see is an experience. Um, and when I asked my professors, uh, you know, they would show me these information processing diagrams, <laughs> and, how, and it, I would ask them naively, but but where is the where is the person that actually receives all this information? Where does it come together as an experience? And the answer was literally, you know, don't ask questions like that. Um, you know, those are those so those sorts of questions are bad for your career. Uh, and, and that is the heart of the matter. It's that subjectivity, the essential nature of the mind, is an embarrassment to science uh, because science strives for objectivity. Um, and so you have to exclude, uh, literally exclude the mind from science uh, if, you're, if you're going to rule out of court uh, the subjective point of view. And uh, so that 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 uh, so it's so a neuropsychology has to exclude the psyche um, if it's going to follow the normal the normal uh, um, um, strictures uh, which is which were firmly in place in the 1980s. So that's why right. I was so frustrated. It was I you know right. I was this 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 fabulously interesting mystery you know of how mind and brain uh, relate. Uh, was just sort of swept under the carpet, and we just we just treated the mind uh, the way we treated the mind is the same way as we would treat how the computer processes information, and yet there's this fundamental difference between a mind and a computer. Uh, as I said a few minutes ago, you know, there's nothing it is like to be a computer. One assumes. Right. I think this dilemma that exists in the study of the mind, psychology, neuroscience that we're studying the subject, and there, there's an inherent dilemma in that where the scientific method, this striving for objectivity, only gets you so far. And you include a quote of Oliver Sacks in your book that goes, neuropsychology is admirable, but it ex excludes the psyche. It excludes the experiencing, active, living eye. And I understand that it's exactly this problem that prompted you to venture into psychoanalysis. So I'm interested, how did you make this transition? What did this time in your life look like? And why specifically psychoanalysis? Uh, yeah, that quote of Oliver Sacks uh, is just wonderful. He wrote that in 1984. And uh, I immediately struck up a correspondence with him because that described Amazing. my experience exactly. Um, because a, a consciousness, which is pretty much the same thing as subjectivity, um, was, um, to, to use the Latin term, scientia non grata, it was not, <laughs> it was not welcome uh, in, in neuroscience. Um, the only way I could study it those days was uh, the, the one aspect of consciousness that was respectable was sleep and waking. You know, the, 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 the brain mechanisms were regulating sleep versus wakefulness. Of course, the main difference between sleep and wakefulness is you're conscious when you're awake. Um, <laughs> and so it was through that little narrow um, uh, window that I was able to uh, bring this topic, uh, uh, you know, br br bring myself in contact with this topic. And um, the when I said the thing that distinguishes sleep uh, from wakefulness is that you are conscious when you're awake, I did not say, and you're unconscious when you're asleep, because there are times during sleep that you are conscious, and that's when you're dreaming. So um, that was 
That was my trick. I thought, okay, I'm allowed to study sleep and wakefulness. So let me study sleep and let me study this curious aspect of sleep, um, which um, which uh, can't be called wakefulness because you're asleep and yet you're conscious. Um, uh, so 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 my my doctoral research was on brain mechanisms of dreaming. Um, now. Uh, I told you what my professors said to me when I asked them the naive questions that I did. Um, so uh, I was um, my uh, attention was caught um, by a open seminar that was being taught uh, at my university by a professor of comparative literature, not a scientist. Okay. And the the seminar was on Freud's interpretation of dreams, this famous book of his on the interpretation of dreams that he published in 1900. So I attended that seminar because it was open to all faculties. Um, and uh, because, you know, here was somebody who was actually willing to talk about the content of dreams, the the, the experience of dreams, you know, the subjective uh, aspect of, of dreams. And uh, I was really just sort of attending out of interest, trying to, you know, sort of floundering about trying to find somebody <laughs> who would tell me something about the experiential aspect of things. And I was just absolutely blown away, not only by this. I mean, he was a very brilliant teacher, this chap. Uh, his name was Jean-Pierre Delaporte. Uh, but, but, but also by the fact that he said to us, uh, the people in this seminar of his, that you can only understand Freud's theorizing about dreams um, if you read a, an earlier thing that he wrote in 1895, uh, which is which is which he never published, uh, which was which was a manuscript that that uh, when it was published after Freud's death was just, was given the title Project for a Scientific Psychology, and and this was written while Freud was still a neuroscientist, and he was trying to trying to. Um, speculate really about what the brain mechanisms might be uh, whereby these mental phenomena truly mental phenomena because as i said he was not embarrassed by subjectivity he his approach was experience exists it's part of nature look yeah we have it right now we you know we're observing it empirically right it's a um, fact yeah so so um his his approach was to adjust scientific methods to the objects of study rather than to you know to adjust the objects of study to scientific methods which requires us to leave out subjectivity so so you know the fact that Freud, I didn't even know Freud was a neuroscientist um, right. and so this this manuscript of his just absolutely fascinated me because you know the, there he was 100 and, you know what years ago Although at that stage in my career it was it would have been uh, ninety years before uh, I read that that uh, that paper of his, um, you know, there he was trying to do exactly what I was asking my professors about, sort of what what kinds of brain mechanisms make experience possible, and um, so that's what interest got me interested in psychoanalysis, realizing that um, that. Freud was a neuroscientist that he had tried to do this without the, the tools we have today. Uh, and I thought, well, there you have it. That's going to be my, my, uh, my path in life is I'm going to continue along that road. I'm going to try again 90 years later uh, using the tools we have today uh, to see, um, you know, uh, what progress can we make trying to address the questions that, that, that Freud had started with. So, um, in order to uh, pr properly uh, uh, base myself, uh, you know, to use, if I'm going to use that starting point of Freud as a foundation and try and bring it into uh, modern science, uh, then I need to properly immerse myself in this theory and, th and this method, you know, called psychoanalysis. And so that's why I decided to train in psychoanalysis to my colleagues' horror and my <laughs> horror, you know. One of them said to me, it's like an astronomer studying astrology. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. That just shows you the, the misunderstanding, you know, yeah. of the misplacement of subjectivity itself. So you, you're in psychoanalysis at this point. You know, you're immersed in these ideas and you're exploring dreams. Can you give us, you know, 
give the audience a bit of history on the study of dreams from from Freud's interpretation of dreams and his wish fulfillment theory yeah. to the different opposing theories that came up in neuroscience afterwards and then you know your research on the brainstem that showed that Freud really was right yeah i you must remember that training in psychoanalysis involves uh, it's not just learning um, a theory and learning uh, a, a method uh, it also requires you to submit yourself to psychoanalysis right so right. so i i a very big part of my um education in that field was the privilege of being psychoanalyzed myself and there you have first hand experience um of these sorts of things um and uh, including dreams you know so what i was reading um or had read in freud's interpretation of dreams had been taught by that uh, 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 co comparative literature professor and all of that you know i i then had you know the, the most immediate um basis for forming a judgment about whether this is all nonsense or not um so it was it was quite something uh, to to be able to see how because freud's theory i mean let's be let's be honest it's not exactly self evident you know it's right. not it's not immediately um compellingly plausible uh, that <laughs> freud says you know that this is what freud claims that um behind every dream there is an attempt to fulfill a, a, a very heartfelt wish you know that there's a there's a strong motivational drive behind each dream where the dreamer is trying to represent as fulfilled uh, some some heartfelt desire and um if you look at the content of your dreams uh, that doesn't seem to square uh, with with our everyday experience you know it's um most dreams are far from gratifying uh, they're bewildering at at best and frightening at worst um so so uh, you know that that that's why the experience of 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 anal of having your own dreams analyzed you know was quite an important part of it because you know what most people don't uh, sufficiently heed uh, is that Freud is not saying the dream is is a fulfillment of a wish he's saying that there's a, a hidden wish that you know you're that that is attempting uh, to come out and then the dream process disguises it and you know does all sorts of things which again um, make people you know find it hard to believe that all of these gymnastics are going on in our right, mind right right sleeping so that was the psychoanalytic side of it um the the as i said when freud invented all of this stuff you know there was no um it was based purely on psychological study of of patients uh, there was no neuroscientific methods uh, uh, to speak of uh, whereby we could get any direct access to what's going on in the brain so so after freud's death um we started uh, we neuroscientists started to study what's going on in the brain during sleep and during dreams and um, to cut a long story short it was discovered that there's that there's a process called rem sleep rapid eye movement sleep um and it happens automatically uh, roughly every 90 minutes uh, and it's driven by a brain chemical called acetylcholine uh, and mm -hmm. this just arouses the brain you know every every 90 minutes it just sort of like boots up uh, reactivates uh, the forebrain uh, and during this time as we understood it on the basis of the work that was done uh, by scientists over the 50s 60s 70s into the 80s which is when i came into the field uh, was that it's a automatic uh, you know because it happens every 90 minutes these cells just start firing um there's nothing to do with psychological dynamics nothing to do with what happened between you and your mummy you know it's a, right it's right a, it's just going to happen uh, like clockwork um and the part of the brain uh, that generates this arousal has got no motivational function uh, it's it's just random noise uh, and so uh, as as alan hobson who was the main authority in the field at that time put it he said that the forebrain makes the best of a bad job it just sort of like joins <laughs> joins the dots um and uh, that's why dreams are so bizarre and nonsensical and impossible um 
and that seemed, you know, that, that's from, from a purely neuroscientific point of view, that seemed that seemed perfectly plausible. The problem is that the research that Hobson uh, built upon and did himself was all uh, almost all of it. In fact, pretty much all of it was done in in cats and rats. Okay. Um, and you know, I feel very sorry for those cats and rats. <laughs> but from a scientific point of view, the big problem is that you can't study their dreams. You can only study the physiology, you know. So in human beings, you wake human beings up during REM sleep, they say, I'm dreaming, 90% of the time. Wake them up outside of REM sleep, uh, only 10% of the time do they say they're dreaming. So th that correlation was made in humans who can speak and say, I am dreaming, you know, or I was right. dreaming. Um, but once that correlation had been made in humans, in order to do the neuroscience, you know, where you have to poke around, snip around, uh, and and stimulate and so on. Um, the, the the work was done in other animals that also have REM sleep, and all mammals have REM sleep. And so, so the 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 poor uh, victims of that research were cats <laughs> and rats. So I I thought, well, if we're going to study the experiential aspect of this, because remember that was my whole starting point was I was interested in the subjective aspect of brain function. So um, I shifted attention to human beings. Obviously, I didn't do experiments on their brains. Uh, I, I waited for experiments of nature, namely brain disease. So patients who had strokes and tumors and so on. Uh, it, it, I had a very large number of patients, uh, 360 odd patients, uh, with groups of them with damage in different parts of the brain. And I was wanting to see you know, what happens to the experience of dreaming uh, when uh, the part that generates REM sleep is damaged, uh, but also what, what happens uh, to the experience of dreaming uh, when, when other parts of the brain are damaged. So we can sort of put together, just as we do uh, with, with other mental functions, I wanted to do with, with dreaming, like we did with language, like we did with memory, like we did with vision and so on. I wanted to piece together what the contribution of the different parts of the brain are uh, to to the experience, the qualitative phenomenology of dreaming. And um, that was when I made two very surprising discoveries. Uh, we're, we're now moving into the 1990s, by the way. Um, the, the, um, the one was that patients with damage to the part of the brain uh, that generates REM sleep um, in humans, just as in cats and rats, uh, you damage that part of the brain, REM sleep stops. Okay. But dreaming does not. These patients, I mean, to my absolute uh, dismay, uh, these patients continue to report dreams, um, despite the complete absence of REM sleep. And uh, the, the second really surprising finding was that there was another group of patients with damage in an entirely different part of the brain from the part that generates REM sleep, when there was damage in that part of the brain, they lost dreams, but 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 REM sleep persisted. So what that showed, we call that we call that a double dissociation of function. What it shows okay. is that the that dreaming and REM sleep are two separate functions. They correlate with each other. They occur at the same time, but they're not the same thing because you can lose the one and retain the other uh, in both directions. So 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 that's. Now, uh, I, I mean, I, I gather from what you said beforehand about me telling you about Freud's theory of dreams, the, the really important part of all of this is that the area of the brain which, when damaged, leads to a complete cessation of dreaming, uh, the, 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 which was not the part, the acetylcholine uh, uh, um, generating part that generates REM sleep, but rather a dopamine-mediated uh, brain circuit uh, which has everything to do with motivation. In fact, there's this the right. big ticket motivational system of the mammalian brain. So, so that um, you know that was uh, really st a strong um, uh, vindication that Freud's psychological observations that there was this powerful, wishful, um, uh, uh, motivational urge behind the dream process um, as 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 as. Uh, as unlikely as that seems from just the surface phenomena of dreams, uh, Freud said when you probe you know, into the person's thought processes, uh, you find that what lies behind these 
uh, strange experiences uh, that we call dreams is this strong motivational urge. The fact that I found that there's the, the brain's strongest motivational circuit is the one that drives dreams uh, made me think that, wow, you know, we neuroscientists owe Freud an apology big time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, to learn, you know, 90 years later to have actual physical evidence that it's exactly these circuits, this seeking system, you know, this motivational moving towards a goal, dopamine hit system that's actually activated during dreams is incredible. And from what I understand, it wasn't uh, lightly accepted. It wasn't easily accepted at first, uh, these findings. Yeah. As you said. Well, um, it wasn't only because it... Um, it flew in the face of everything that we'd learned over decades about REM sleep. And you can imagine, uh, you've spent your entire career studying brain mechanisms of REM sleep. Um, who, why should REM sleep be interesting? Well, it's because when, that's when we dream, you know. Uh, and, and then to, to find you know, that after all, uh, the, the mechanism of REM sleep is not what generates dreams. That, that's not going to be welcome just because it's, it, it leaves egg on your face. But the other reason it wasn't welcomed is precisely because it seemed to vindicate Freud. And, um, you know, you're, you're not, it's not the easiest way to win friends and influence people by saying, <laughs> you know, I think perhaps we made a mistake. Freud might have been right after all. Right, right. I mean, I think this goes to the core of the issue where the scientific method is pristine, but at the end of the day, we have scientists who are all human and we all have our biases and our prejudices. So even when confronted with facts, you know, if someone uh, doesn't prescribe to a certain uh, to a certain belief, then you know they can they can interpret the facts however they wish. Yeah. So already here, you know, we're seeing this interest in the brainstem and this understanding that these different circuits, you know, these more primal circuits. Um, have a lot of influence on us. So more recently in your latest book, The Hidden Spring, you've examined the wider question of the source of consciousness itself. And that's no small endeavor. Um, I'm fascinated by your take of how feelings and emotions are at the core of our conscious experience. But before we get into your research on the topic, can you give the audience the lay of the land, if you will, on how the study of consciousness has been pursued up until now and why this problem is such a hard one. First of all, we have to be grateful that the problem of consciousness became a respectable problem in neuroscience in the first Absolutely. place. Absolutely. Because remember, in, in, when I entered the field, it was not. And, and we have more than anybody else, we have to thank Francis Crick, uh, the chap who discovered the, the double helix, you know, the, 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 right. the, the structure of DNA. Um, he, because he had such impeccable credentials, you know, he could afford to take the risk and say, come on, you know, let's, let's try and tackle this problem now. Um, we, we've got the tools. Uh, let's, let's, let's face the problem of consciousness head on. And he, he, he did that from the mid 1990s. And uh, which is roughly when I, when I was completing my dream research, or at least my, the first great tranche of my dream research. And uh, he's, he's, his approach was, we need to identify what he called the neural correlate of consciousness, NCC. Um, and he said, uh, let's look at vision. Uh, why did he say, let's look at vision? Uh, well, it's because, uh, look at your consciousness now. What is it dominated by? It's dominated by vision. Um, you know, visual consciousness is very prominent in our consciousness. And uh, also, uh, we know a great deal about the brain mechanisms of vision. Um, a, 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 a large part of the cortex is given over to visual uh, processing. So Crick said, if we can crack the problem of how visual consciousness comes about, then we can generalize it to the other forms of consciousness. And I say again, I think that was a perfectly reasonable place to start. It's understandable why he did. Um, and so what his, what his basic approach was is we need to look at what differentiates visual processing when it's conscious from visual processing when it's unconscious. And uh, because there is such a thing as unconscious visual processing, there's the famous right. phenomenon of blindsight, that you have patients who have damage to the visual cortex, 
um, who therefore are blind. In other words, they have no visual consciousness, but they still deftly navigate around obstacles in their path um, because they can see them. They just don't know that they can see them. They're seeing that they're processing the information unconsciously, just like a camera can. A, a camera, the camera on your computer or on your phone uh, can process visual information, but uh, but it can't see in, in in the conscious sense of having visual qualities. Um, so Crick was saying, let's let's see what is what happens in the brain only when it's consciously seeing, as opposed to when it's just unconsciously processing visual information. And the difference is in the visual cortex. Uh, that, that's uh, that's why blind sight, which is due to cortical damage. Uh, leads to a loss of conscious vision, uh, but you still have unconscious vision. So that was what the lay of the land was, more or less, when I when I started to enter that fray. It was, we were all trying to answer, uh, my colleagues were all trying to answer the question of how does the brain generate consciousness, focusing on, on visual perception. Okay. And, you know, there's this a very famous paper uh, by David Chalmers, The Hard Problem of Consciousness, where he, you know, he highlights what the hard problem is, but he also mentions the easy problems. And he talks about these approaches of, um, you know, taking these segments of consciousness, these different functions, such as visual processing. And he says, that's an easy problem. That's an information processing system that we can understand, you know, input and output. Um, and he he highlights this hard problem. So I'd love if you could tell us a little bit about that and why it is such a difficult problem to explore. Well, the the easiest way to explain that is to use the uh, there's a famous story told by another philosopher that that uh, Chalmers draws upon. His name is Frank Jackson, um, and Jackson coined this thing called the knowledge argument, in which he's mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to simplify what he said. But um, right. he said, basically, imagine a visual neuroscientist named Mary who knows everything there is to know about the functional mechanism of vision. In other words, at the physiological, even the physics level, you know, the photons of light impacting on the cells of the retina uh, where those uh, you know, uh, uh, light waves are transduced into neural impulses along very specific nervous pathways. Uh, Mary knows all of this stuff. She knows everything we know about the mechanism of visual information processing. Um, but Mary is blind. Uh, th th this, is, this is the rub in this argument. Um, right. So she doesn't know what it's like to see. Uh, and says um, Frank Jackson, if uh, the gift of sight were suddenly to be bestowed on Mary, she would learn something utterly new about vision. Namely, what redness is like, what blueness is like, uh, what, it, what it actually, what the qualities of visual experience are like. And indeed, that there is such a thing as visual experience. Because uh, 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 Jackson's argument is, uh, firstly, that nothing about what she knew, uh, the knowledge that she had about visual information processing, nothing about that prepared her for what it is like to see. In other words, nothing in there explained the qualities of visual experience, uh, and and indeed it didn't it didn't explain why there has to be something it is like to see at all. Because let us not forget, as I said earlier, cameras, uh, computers, telephones, they can see also. Uh, in other words, they can also process visual information and recognize things and classify things and so on. As you know, your phone can do that. Right. Um, but uh, th there's not something it is like to be a phone. Um, and so, so Chalmers was saying, this is the hard problem. The normal approach to neuroscience, which is you specify the mechanism that explains the function. He says it doesn't work when it comes to experience, because look at what happened to Mary. You know, she she specified the mechanism until you know down to the nth degree, but it it didn't tell her anything uh, about what it is like to see. And so says Chalmers, you know, we need a different, this is why it's a hard problem. The easy problem is to delineate the function. The hard problem is to say, yes, but why is there something it is like um, to experience that function? Uh, and, and so that, that, that's, the, that's the thing. That, that has become the holy grail of neuroscience, that problem. It's the biggest problem in neuroscience, if not the whole of biological, if not the whole of science, um, you know, this question.
How, how, does, how does subjective experience arise out of a mechanism? Right. And what do you think in the approach today where we're focusing a lot on cognition, you know, and higher cortical functioning? What in your experience, you know, studying areas like the brainstem and studying emotions, um, you know, the work like Panksaps and Damasio's, what led you to the idea that emotions are first and foremost the core of consciousness? Can you tell us about how you came to this idea and what evidence you found that pointed you in this direction? Yeah, well, how I came to the idea, uh, first of all, is I, I told you that uh, in my dream research, I was led to the to realize that this, uh, what we call the seeking system for short, the mesocortical, mesolimbic dopamine system, uh, which arises from a nucleus in the brain stem called the ventral tegmental area. It's a very primitive thing. It's a, I mean, all vertebrates have got one of these, you know. Uh, they, 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 uh, th this is the system that drives the dream process. It's an intensely motivational and emotionally uh, charged um, a, 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 a function that this system performs. Um, and it's, it's the, the, the ventral tegmental area is just one in a set of nuclei in the brainstem uh, that we call the reticular activating system. And uh, why is it called the reticular activating system? It's because it activates the forebrain. So um, it, is the, it is the essential power supply for consciousness. And we've known this for a long time. We've known since the middle of the 20th century that if you damage that area or disconnect that area from the cortex, then the lights go out. I mean, you, you're in a coma. So um, although all of the, the – it's, it's understandable, as I said, that Crick would start with visual cortical functioning. Right. Um, and our own, our own consciousness is dominated by uh, visual perception and, and the cogn cognitive processes that flow from it and the other perceptual modalities. You know, that this, it, it, it is understandable that we would start there. The crucial fact is – that all of that is secondary. Uh, uh, the, 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 the conscious processing of that cortical information is only rendered conscious by virtue of the fact that it's activated from the reticular activating system. Now, we used to think that that was something like a power supply in, in the sense that a television set needs to be plugged in at the wall. You know, if it's not plugged in and switched on, it's not going to do any televisual anything. That, uh, but that doesn't mean that the power source at the wall is is really the source of television. It's just a necessary prerequisite that in, you got to, it enables you to have a television set that does televisual things because it, it has to be powered up. That's what we thought the reticular activating system was. But as I told you, uh, the 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 seeking system doesn't just power up your, your forebrain. It gives it a very particular, motivated, energized... I mean, if you upregulate dopamine, you go into a manic state and eventually into a psychotic state. You know, and if you upregulate or downregulate all of these chemicals that come from these brainstem arousal systems, it doesn't just switch on or switch off the lights. It switches on or off very particular, intense affective states. Affect means feeling states, you know, things that feel good or feel bad, but, but feel good or bad in particular ways. So things like fear and rage um, and, and seeking, you know, which is this exploratory curiosity and interest um, and lust, uh, you know, uh, and separation distress and, and, and all these things, you know, all of these very, very basic uh, emotional states, that's what the reticular activating system generates, not just a light switch. It generates affect. So now if you put together these two facts, number one, that this is the prerequisite uh, necessary uh, source of any kind of cortical conscious experience, and two, uh, the fact that it generates a quality uh, and content of experience, which is quite different from the cortical type, namely feelings, um, that suggested to me two things. Number one, we shouldn't look to the cortex because that's secondarily rendered conscious by the primary source of consciousness, which is in the brainstem. And uh, by the same token, we shouldn't be focusing on visual consciousness because visual consciousness is only possible if it's powered up from below by this 
affective kind of consciousness. In other words, we have to feel our way into our visual information processing um, in order right. for it to become conscious. So that's why I decided to look, um, uh, for all of those reasons, to look uh, to the brainstem instead. And when I say I decided, I have to say uh, it wasn't me alone. I, I was I was, I was was guided in that direction by my great friend, um, now sadly deceased friend and, and, uh, and collaborator, Jak Panksepp. Uh, I was also uh, uh, deeply impressed and influenced by a, another uh, a colleague, uh, Antonio Damasio, who came to the same conclusion uh, in, in Jak Panksepp's footsteps, uh, that, that the, the, the basic form of consciousness, the foundational form of consciousness is feeling. And um, you asked me what the evidence for that is. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I rehearse all that evidence in my book, um, mm -hmm. I, I've, 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 I've uh, mentioned already, you know, that if you damage that area, the lights go out completely. Uh, now, uh, to add to that, if you stimulate those structures, you generate intense feelings. Uh, the, the most intense and wide range of feelings can be generated by stimulating those deep brain stem structures, the, the reticular activating system. Nothing like that happens when you stimulate cortex. Um, if you take brain images, uh, what we call positron emission tomography or PET imaging uh, of the brain when people are in intense affective states like, like rage or joy or fear or sadness. Um, and you look where, where is the brain activity that's generating these states? In other words, where is the highest metabolic turnover? It's in the brain stem, not in the cortex. In fact, not at all in the cortex. It's all, all in the subcortex and all, and, and the epicenter of it is in the brain stem. Um, I already mentioned the chemistry. You know, the, mm -hmm. What few people realize is the, the mainstream of psychiatric medications, in other words, medications for, for modulating emotions, because you know, these are emotional disorders, um, right. antipsychotics, antidepressants, anti-anxiety drugs, and so on, they act on the, on, the, on the neuromodulators that are sourced in the reticular activating system. So, for example, antidepressants, SSRIs, where you increase the availability of serotonin. Serotonin is sourced in the reticular activating system. Uh, dopamine, uh, which we, sp we spoke about earlier, which is the, 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 the big ticket item when it comes to dreams, um, is also the big ticket item when it comes to psychosis, you know, that other delusional right. hallucinatory state like, like dreams. Um, and antipsychotics block dopamine. Uh, 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 many anti-anxiety drugs uh, uh, block norepinephrine, and that's sourced also in the reticular activating system. So that's the sort of evidence, you know, that you, that if you damage it, all, co all consciousness goes. If you stimulate it, you don't generate wakefulness. You generate rage or despair right. or fear, you know, specific intense emotional states. Uh, if you image the brain when you're in those emotional states, uh, you see that's where the activation's coming from. Um, and when you manipulate the chemistries of those circuits, um, uh, then you know you you you're manipulating these feeling states. So that's all of that, uh, and none of that applies to cortex. The, the the cortex thinks about these things, uh, but the feelings themselves, the raw basic ingredients uh, of the, the remember I remember it. Don't lose sight of the fact that this is prerequisite for all cognitive consciousness. All right. cognitive consciousness is predicated on this affective arousal. So, you know, that's the evidence for it. The most striking of all of the evidence is that if you look at, at uh, human beings who are born with no cortex, now if the cortex was the seat of consciousness, those kids should be in a coma. Um, or at the very least, they should be in what we call a vegetative state, which, which right. is defined as non-responsive wakefulness. In other words, they should be blank. There should not be anything it is like to be them. Uh, and that's just not the case. Those kids, uh, they not only do they wake up in the morning, in other words, they're conscious, uh, but they are emotionally responsive. They respond with all of the basic emotional, uh, uh, the things I've just been talking about, things like anger uh, and sadness and fear and, and happiness and playfulness and, you know, these sorts of things. These kids show all of these emotions in situationally appropriate contexts, um, even though they have no cortex at all. So, you know, there's just, there's just oodles of evidence that raw feelings 
the most basic form of consciousness, do not require cortex to come about. Um, and uh, 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 everything points to the reticular activating system of the brainstem. Also, another little nucleus down there yeah. uh, called the periaqueductal gray or PHE. Right, right. No, I think it's so important to understand that while our conscious experience, you know, we might be thinking that our thoughts are our conscious experience, these affective states, they completely color our consciousness, our experience. And they change also, you know, as we move in the world, they change what's salient to us, right? They they change what pops out at us, what's what's a, what becomes apparent to us, these different affective states. And I think what's so important to understand also, this being the source of consciousness, is that all animals, right, all mammals have these universal emotions, these same brain circuits, and that they've evolved for very purposeful reasons, right? They're very sophisticated and built in. And in our Western world, we value analytical, rational thinking. And we think that emotions are just fluff, but they're they're very, very sophisticated in this sense, right? They're very evolved. Um, so I'd love if you could give us a little bit of an outline, you know, what is the difference between feeling and thinking, right? What What is the distinction there? Um, how are they integrated? Um, and then we'll, I'd love to unpack emotions in general a bit later. Yeah. So let me say, first of all, that um, it is, again, understandable that we would use human, uh, you know, our own experience as our starting point. But if you think about it in evolutionary biological terms, you know, it's kind of crazy to think that consciousness starts with us. Um, right. You know, especially in light of what you've said about, about um, you know, these the, 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 these primitive emotional states uh, in animals. It's clearly, uh, obviously the case, um, you know, that, for example, dogs get angry and get scared, uh, you know, and show separation distress and so on. You know, anybody who's got a pet cat or a pet dog, you know, knows that, of course, they, they have feelings. Um, but when you look at what those feelings are about, uh, think about what I've just said, you know, what what is fear? Uh, it means that I'm in danger uh, of coming to to physical harm. You know that I might die. Uh, this is a biological matter of great importance, whether you survive or not. Um, and rage. You know, if you don't stake your claim on the resources in the territory, um, you know, and you, you you can't fight for your for your stake. Uh, you know, then uh, you, you, you're, again, you're not going to survive. You have to be able to be frustrated by people or, or animals, other conspecifics, you know, getting in the way and preventing you from getting your share. Um, separation distress for us mammals, we we can't look after ourselves when we're born. Uh, we, we th th This is the defining feature of mammals is we have to be suckled. And right. uh, so we need to attach to somebody who looks after us. And if we don't, you know, so separation distress is an expression of, again, a basic survival mechanism. And, you know, so the, and the same applies. So the idea that feelings uh, and emotions are fluffy things, I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. They are, they are much more important to our survival than analytical philosophy, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, so although it's understandable we started with this highest most complex form of consciousness that exists in nature namely our own you know surprise surprise we put ourselves at the center of it <laughs> um you know really it was the wrong place to start we should have started with these much more elementary forms uh, and and despite the bad press that feelings get uh, as i hope i've just explained they are fundamentally important biologically and so it's no surprise uh, to learn that consciousness started with these primitive feeling states, um, which actually drive the engine of the mind. You asked me, what is the relationship between, uh, between feelings or affects, as we call them technically, and cognitions? Mm -hmm. Basically this, that feeling um, is a demand on the mind to perform work. In other words, there's a problem here. You know, I am in danger. Uh, I am separated from my caregiver. I have a frustrating ob obstacle in my way, preventing me from getting what I need. I got to do something about that. So feelings like fear right. and rage uh, and and uh, and panic, uh, these feelings are demands 
on the mind to perform work. In other words, here's a problem that you've got to solve. Cognition is that work. It's the work demanded by the by the by the affects. So you know. So again, please note the hierarchy. You know, first comes the need which you feel. Secondly, comes the response to that need. Okay, let me think my way through this problem. And uh, that, in a very, very small nutshell, um, is the essence of the relationship between the two. Now, a crucial point in the cognitive side of things is, you know, so in the affective side, it's good and bad, you know, feel good feelings and bad feelings tell you if things right, are going right. well or badly, you know, you're going in the right direction or the wrong direction. Um, in cognition, uh, the, the equivalent of good and bad is more like correct and incorrect. You know, it's like, this is logical, this is illogical, this is rational, right. this is irrational, this is true, this is false. These are the cognitive sort of equivalents. And they are rooted in a value system. You know, you have to, uh, where, do, where do these ideas come from? You know, where do these abstractions come from? A any kind of choice has to be rooted in a value system which says what's better and what's worse. Otherwise, it's random. You know, there's no basis for making a choice if both are equally valuable. So feelings are our most basic value system, which reflects, by the way, the value system upon which the whole of life is based, namely it's good to survive and bad not to. Okay, this is the, this is the thing that drives the whole of evolution and the whole of life. And so those feelings then dictate whether your cognitive plans are working or not. In other words, if I can right. put it in a pithy formulation, if things are working out as expected, that's good. In other words, if your plans are coming to fruition. Right, you're it, moving towards the goal. Yeah, that feels good. Um, uh, that's why it is good. It's because it means your needs are going to be met. Um, and right. if uncertainty prevails, in other words, if cognitively you you you, you don't get it, you can't solve it, uh, it it's this is bad. It's bad because you know, it's actually a matter of life and death, ultimately. It means you haven't solved the problem. The number one problem being, how do I meet my, my biological needs? So, so you know, that, that's, that's the essential uh, uh, nature of the relationship between, between feelings um, and thoughts. Right. I imagine, you know, m mammals having these instincts as well, but also, you know, the single cell organism, you know, moving you know, through space and trying to get, you know, to, to the things that it needs and these value instincts, these value signals, um, you know, indicating whether we're moving towards survival and reproduction or not, you know, they're at the base of everything. And yes. with us, it's just a little bit more complex and trying to understand our emotions and, you know, everything's nested in a value hierarchy. Uh, there's trade-offs between our needs. So the whole study of emotions and, the problem solving that arises around them becomes a little bit more complicated, but you know, at the root, we have have the same systems operating within yeah, us. Yeah. To get uh, the the name of Freud back into the conversation, yeah. uh, let us not forget that these needs conflict with each other. And right. So, uh, so uh, that's also why we, as much as I'm saying that the higher cognitive capacities of the human brain. Um, are not the starting point of consciousness. Nevertheless, I'm very grateful to have a human brain um, because you know we have we have a unique capacity to be able to uh, resolve all of these in all of these complexities. And the most important thing you spoke about a single cell. Mm -hmm. um, the simpler uh, creatures, um, simpler organisms, they solve life's problems by reflex. In other words, they've right. got one and only one solution. You know, if 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 everything, uh, you know, if if all I've got is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And so they just, you know, it's like they they just do the same thing. And if they're in an uncertain situation, in other words, an, a situation for which that reflex is not the correct solution, or that stereotyped instinctual behavior is not the correct solution, they have no alternative. That's the only thing they can do. So consciousness is not is not right at the very beginning of life. Uh, the, the, the problem of how to stay alive is there right at the beginning of life. But what feeling adds is this capacity for choice. 
In other words, right. imagine you're in, um, you know, normally respiratory control. Let's take that example. It's aut it's autonomic. You're, you're not conscious of your need for oxygen. Uh, but now you enter into an unpredicted situation, like you're in a carbon dioxide filled room. Suddenly you become aware of your need to breathe. That's a bad feeling. Okay. That's negative affect, as we call it. That's the demand for work. You've got to do something. And now you've got, you've never been in a burning building before, let alone this particular one. Uh, so you don't know what to do. This is what feeling is for. If you make right. the right decision, like you, you, you go downstairs and you feel now I can breathe. That's a good feeling. It tells you you're going the right way. If you go upstairs and there's less oxygen up there, um, you feel more air hunger, more suffocation alarm. So the feeling tells you you've made the wrong cognitive decision. So the, so the, the feeling underwrites the capacity for choice and for voluntary behavior. So it's in, in the evolutionary series, um, it's only when feeling evolved, this extended form of homeostasis of, of how, of how to meet our biological needs, which enables choice, uh, that, that is, that is where, where the dawn of consciousness is to be located. Okay. And I'm wondering, you know, with this understanding that emotions are at the core of consciousness, what kind of research would you like to see happening in the future, you know, in the in the near future with this new understanding around consciousness, around neuroscience as well? I think that, um, you know, th that's such a big question. There's so much that needs to be done. But I think that the principle um, is that we need to recognize that all of this cognitive machinery, all of these, I mean, it's brilliant that we've got fantastically uh, 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 sophisticated tools, both technical tools and conceptual tools for understanding visual processing, auditory processing, language processing, memory processing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, we, we tend to sort of like... Um, the, 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 they become kind of reified. You know, that we, we forget that the, the only reason that we have all of this cognitive machinery is because we have to learn. Cogn the cognition is there for learning how to meet our biological needs. So I think that we will never properly understand how those cognitive functions uh, uh, work if we don't understand that they are ultimately right. rooted in meeting biological needs. Um, and uh, so that when you say what kind of research would I like to see happening, I'd like to see a more embodied, a more biologically plausible, uh, 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 a, a more, a more s sort of also what, what uh, you know, I mentioned my colleague Jak Panksepp earlier, uh, right. ma many many people accused him of being anthropocentric. They said, I mean, uh, of being uh, 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 anthropomorphic. They, they, they say okay. you're treating animals as if they're humans. You know, you 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 you're speaking about right. their minds, like laughing rats yeah, and all yeah, sorts of things of thing. like that. And, <laughs> and, and what what Yark said was, I would rather be accused um, of being r r rather than anthropomorphic towards animals. I want to be zoomorphic towards humans. In other words, right, right, us, right. we are ultimately, you know, a species of animal and uh, that you won't understand how our cognitions work and even what they're there for. If you don't see us as part of the greater sort of um, family uh, of, 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 of living things. Um, right. So I think know, understanding these circuits and these emotions, you know, for instance, play in mammals, right? And, and rough and tumble play and how, how necessary that is for little children and how we're treating them with ADD and all of these problems, yeah. you know, that we're solving, that if we understood the root, you know, of the matter, we'd, our approach would be completely different. I mean, all we have to do is look at our own lives. You know, what matters is how we feel. <laughs> right. It's, uh, it's, the, Absolutely. It's, it's the heart Absolutely. of the matter. <laughs> I'd love to ask you, you know, um, before we wrap up, you know, looking back, what advice would you give your 20 year old self starting out? Um, well, actually, uh, the advice I would give myself is the advice that I took, except nobody gave me that advice. <laughs> uh, it, it, it is don't, don't be, don't be sidetracked from the, the 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 naive questions that interested you in the first place. You know, I think 
I was far from being the the, the, the only neuroscientist who came into the field uh, expecting to be in, in, you know, engaging with these profound mysteries. I mean, what's more important than, you know, what brings me about? How do I come into existence, this sentient experiencing self? It is a massively important scientific question. How does that happen? Um, and yet, you know, you get it beaten out of you in grad school and told, you know, to <laughs> ask embarrassing questions. So I think I think that's my advice is you know don't forget why what fascinated you what motivated you in the first place don't be don't shy away from naive questions they are the most important questions and um uh, and that's that's what I that's what I advise my, my students uh, you know uh, 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 today and um, if I can take a slightly different approach to your question yeah. Um, since you mentioned play, and it is true, mammals need to play. We need to play, like we need to eat and drink. We need right. to play, and um, so I, I would another another piece of advice I would give is although it's very important, you know, in life that you've got to face up to all of these problems. I told you, you know, life is all about meet solving these problems, learning how to meet your needs in the world. One of those needs is a need to have fun. So you must also enjoy yourself, you know, while while you while you're facing up to all of life's realities. We have to face up to to facts, especially unwelcome facts, because um, they're there. You know, even if you don't look at them, they're still there, uh, and they're still having their effects. But life isn't only about solving life's problems; it's also about enjoying yourself. Brilliant, brilliant. I will personally take those two pieces of advice. Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for coming on the Bigger Picture podcast Thanks and sharing me. your work with us. Thank you.